So that's fun. Today we're talking about brass and specifically the brass that I've got in my template. And admittedly, I do have a lot more libraries that I own that I don't have in my template. Not because they're bad. I just chose the ones I chose because of the way they sound by themselves and the way they can complement each other. So after hearing that, if you recognize those opening four notes, then bonus points to you. Extra bonus points and a big gold star if you know where Williams got the idea for that opening. The only hint I'll give you is it's classical music. But once you realize what the piece is and you listen to them together, they sound completely different, but they have the same orchestration solo horn with four notes and then some woodwinds come in just like they do after this thing. Now let's take a look at this. I'm going to play it again. And what I like about this is I was just trying to figure out the best way to showcase what I like about each library. So this audio is obviously a live performance. Berlin, sample modeling, Spitfire, and Cinebrass. So I'm just going to let this play one more time. So obviously we're dealing with completely different performances and instruments. This, this poor horn player sounds like they were really nervous and it was pretty out of tune. Believe it or not, I actually tuned this in Cubase. It was so sharp. I just couldn't bear to use it as an example unless I brought it a little more in tune. So really, I did these in the order that I prefer. And I know I am... Well, I'm not cheating, but using a solo horn patch to demonstrate an entire brass library isn't exactly fair. But I think that with brass, especially the new libraries we've gotten in the last couple of years, the big over-the-top epic thing is kind of covered in so many different places. And it's the more lyrical, sensitive, and especially solo passages that I really focus in on. Even if I'm doing something big and epic, I'll a lot of times have those solo parts playing on top of them. So the first thing I have playing is Berlin, just solo horn. And the beauty of Berlin, like I said in the previous woodwind tutorial, is they actually have four different horns. So that's just the first one. So really, you could just take this MIDI data, copy it down to each one, solo each one, and figure out which soloist you want to play that part. Next is sample modeling. And I'm going to look at all these in a little more detail as we go down the template. This is just a quick overview. Now, the beauty of sample modeling 
is you can actually do vibrato and a bunch of other kind of things and change everything in real time because it's actually modeled and not just playing straight samples. So very expressive. Actually, the sample and modeling horn is what I used in Tomb Raider for Roth, who was sort of Lara's father figure in that game. He had a theme that was very kind of plaintive, and I used solo French horn a lot. And I played it, normally I use a mouthpiece uh, breath controller. When we get down to sample modeling, I'll talk a little more about it. But the beauty of it is, I played it in real time with the breath controller, and I even recorded a couple of little breaths in between the phrases, and I had multiple professors or um, professional horn players and orchestras contact me wanting to know who the horn player was because there was not a horn soloist listed in the credits because they really loved the tone and the performance. And it felt kind of bad saying, well, actually, it's, 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 I'm, it's my performance, but it's a computer that's, that's playing that horn. It's a sample. So we've really come a long way in terms of control and quality. All the sample modeling stuff is really, really nice. And then the third MIDI example was Spitfire, which has a beautiful tone. And sometimes I have a little bit of issue controlling kind of the legato transitions and getting a little more of an expressive performance out of it. But that's more about massaging the MIDI data, which you can see like I've got a little down. I think that was maybe volume modulation. So I'm using modulation there. And each one of these I, I tweaked individually kind of for the particular library. They all have different controllers. And then this is the Cinebrass, which again has a really nice timbre. But as you can see, I had the modulation set to zero because anything above that, it starts getting really loud really quickly. And I actually use the volume this time to sort of taper down because I had it playing as quietly as it could. With that being said, let's see, I'm going to go back here. And we'll start at the top and I'm just going to mute all of these so that we don't get into any trouble. And I've already talked about the woodwinds and some general Cubase things in the previous tutorial. So today we're going to go through brass. As with the woodwinds, all of these MIDI channels line up with the same MIDI channels I have in VE Pro. Except here, it's kind of blown out a lot more because in VE Pro, I've got instances of contact, and each contact instance can have up to 16 instruments. So really, you just see a contact instance, and then you see maybe a pair of outputs for shorts and longs, maybe three pairs if there's some effects. But now that we're back here in Cubase, we're getting kind of the granular every single individual instrument that's in contact. Berlin is the only library I know that has four individual French horns. It's just, it's just really nice to have. And if you want to hear them each, Now what's really interesting about this is different players and different instruments, but the legatos are different as well. Um, one and three had particularly nice legatos, I thought. I love the tone for one and two, and you may have noticed four is a little loud. This comes as a bit of a problem when you're trying to balance the sections, because your fourth horn is going to be overpowering the other three.
Now, since we're doing a unison line, that's not quite as important. But if this were four-part harmony, this bottom guy, who usually is the lowest note and by nature would be sounding louder anyway, he really sticks out. And a lot of times I go into my Cubase VE Pro returns on my first mixing board and adjust that fourth horn because it's just too loud. That's kind of all there is to it. But we've got legatos, longs, portados, shorts, all the usual crescendos and swells and things like that. And I have them split out between the four horns. And this is how I have my own brass library. It was so refreshing, just like with Berlin Woodwinds, to see that they had the same thing for their brass. And the legato horn is also... I love that they have them together because it gives you the chance Now I just did that in real time, so it's slightly different than the MIDI performance I recorded, but since those are individual horns up here, and down here it's all four horns playing together, a lot of times I'll stack them. So if I want to make it sound like eight horns, get a little bit of a bigger sound there. And stacking brass, I found with MIDI or live, which I did once, um, is very much like stacking strings in the sense that if you record four players twice, or like the example that we just had, kind of four players and then a unison four, it doesn't sound like eight players. It sounds like maybe six. So you're kind of increasing your numbers by about 50%. This is especially true with strings. If you have to do a limited number of string players because of your budget and you think, well, I'm going to go and just record everything twice. I only have 20 string players. That'll make it sound like 40. It's going to make it sound more like 28 or 30. So a lot of times I just write for the ensemble size that I have. And if I know that we can only afford 24 or 30 string players, I'm not expecting to make it bigger, unless maybe I'm layering it with some samples from the demo tracks that I did. That works a lot better because you've got the live performance that's a lot more nuanced and, and technically accurate. And then you're getting the MIDI, which usually is beefier and sounds bigger because it's a bigger ensemble. And you put them together and they sort of fit like, like this got the MIDI that's beefy and then the live is sort of like the toppings on the top of the hamburger. I've been trying to avoid food comparisons up until now because I'm a little obsessed with it. Hamburgers and pizza and if I talk about it too much we're gonna have to stop recording and just go straight to lunch. Same thing with the trumpets. Three individual trumpets which is great all their individual articulations plus recorded as a unison. Again, I will stack those. The rare occasion I'm using trumpets, sometimes I want them to be super big. And then let's see, can we fit everything? There we go. And then that's all the low brass. The trombones, bass trombones, tubas. I have the legatos grouped together and then everything sort of split out individually according to articulation. And then we've got some arc brass, which honestly I have in the template and I haven't ever even used. But this is arc three, and they've got lots of clusters and things, and some repetition performances, which are nice. So this is all the arc, the trumpets, the low brass. And now I've admitted this before when I was going through the VE Pro, but I'm a real sample hog. So there's a library that I like I just put it, the whole thing in the template. That's why there's so many articulations here. And that's why I've got, I don't know how many tracks that is for ARC. They're all there. So if I'm doing something and I need it, it's ready to go. The channel's labeled. I don't need to go hunting for the right sort of feel and auditioning each one and loading each one into contact, going to the next one, going to the next one. It's literally just me saying, I want a cluster. Oh, well, tight versus wide. What's the difference there? And I can play it. Oh, I see. That's a tight cluster and that's a wider cluster. I immediately know the difference. I don't have to load it. And if I want to use it, it's labeled and ready to go. 
it's all about speed. It's, it's always all about speed. So that's Berlin. And next we have Spitfire. Very nice solo horn. That's what we heard in the example. And these are the same horn times four. So it's literally, that's not supposed to be like that. That's probably supposed to be on two. It's literally the same patch. I just have it labeled one, two, three, and four. And this is purely so that I can use it if I were writing for four solo horns, if it were a brass ensemble chorale kind of feel, and I really wanted to use the timbre of those Spitfire horns, I can do a four part writing. And even though it's just the same dude playing all four notes, I still have four notes of legato. And I'm not a big fan of the polyphonic legato because I just, I grew up studying orchestra scores, and that's how I think when I'm writing, so I'm picturing those two staves with two horns on each stave, and the line that they're carrying up and down, maybe they won't jump and cross each other, but they might both go down at the same time. Sometimes the legato does a transition to the different note, and maybe I'm being a little picky, but I just, I'm a purist, and I like having everything on its individual line. So this is just solo horn, one, faked out to four. And then I do love that they have a two horn. Again, I fake that out to four so that if I wanted to make it sound like an eight part horn section split into four parts from a composition standpoint, I have access to that as well. And then six horns which you notice I don't have that split out because there's no reason to have, well, maybe 24 horns would be super awesome. But I would be doing that live. I wouldn't be trying to do that if I were just doing a MIDI score. This is probably the most epic sounding horns. Come on, that's just so big and fat. The trumpets are also very nice. And I'm pretty sure that I did the same thing here. It's a single solo trumpet. I have it tripled so I can do three part writing. Same thing here. A single double trumpet patch, which I then made in triplicate. Then the legato, six trumpets, which is also very beefy. I'm kind of in a John Williams mode today, I can't really help it. Super smooth, full, not too harsh, not too shrill. Of course, the hall sounds amazing. And same thing with the low brass. I think that's doubled because there's only one legato trombone. But a lot of this is just self-explanatory. And there's the rest of our low brass down here, some extra articulations, mutes, and things like that. So if I close that out, and we go to Albion. There's actually some, some nice sounds here that, uh, it's more of an ensemble thing, but... You get a little bit of instruments popping out here and there because the ranges, you know, the French horns can only go so high, they cut out and then the trumpets are sort of on their own or you've got an octave. But it is a nice kind of filler patch. Same thing, and, and a lot of these are legato, which is really nice. Told you I was John Williams y today. This is Albion 1, then I've got uh, Albion 3. There isn't any brass in Albion 2, or I would have it here. And then the Masse, I guess you pronounce it that way. Uh, this is, so this is my brass, which I'm not going to bore everybody too much with since you can't purchase it. Um, it's not because I'm mean, it's just because I don't have any interest in making it commercially available. But this is what I was talking about. A 
about having three individual horns. So this is the first pair. Second pair. Third pair. Obviously, they've got a completely different sound between the three of them. When you put them together. And you get that real nice ensemble idea. The whole point of me recording it this way is a lot of times, every time, ever since I did Alpha Protocol, I always use six horns, minimum, which allows me to write triads and just put two horns on a part. And I was such a fan of doing that that it just made sense when I went to sample some horns that I sampled them in pairs. And that way I can write the way I want to write for live and it'll end up sounding live. There's a big difference between six different horns in pairs like that and two horns that are doubled. Same two horns here, same two horns here because you're faking it out in MIDI. It, it just sounds more natural. And if you're curious about the differences, I know that Orchestral Tools has some great videos on their website and they talk about having a single player times four and doing chords versus having four different players and doing chords. There's some great videos where they go through that and you really can hear a difference. It just, it just sounds more live because the, the timbre and instruments are so different that they blend a lot better having all these different partials accentuated and things rather than having the same instrument multiplied. It sounds a little more robotic because it is duplication, even if they're playing different notes. Just, you can only cheat so much. One of the things that I did, I really wish um, some sample libraries would do this, but I have... Well, I have three different shorts, first of all. So here's my, my shortest short. I've got another short that's softer and slightly longer. So if I go between them, I'm actually playing just as hard, but it's a, long, a slightly longer note, so they're playing it a little bit softer. It has less attack on it. And then one of the patches that I use all the time is just a kind of a half second. But I have it for a round robin. It doesn't exactly sound like it's round robining, but that's the whole idea. It also doesn't sound like it's playing the same patch over and over. So it gives me a lot of choice when I want to play different kinds of I can do repetitions like that and it doesn't sound machine gunny, which is the kind of the word that everyone uses when they're not round robining. So for this particular library, I guess if you're interested, I really wanted to have a lot of control over everything. So I have, um, well, they're, they're portato sounds. So I just call them potatoes, but the idea is they're basically a decrescendo with an accent at the beginning. You can hear that it. And I have six different lengths of those that I recorded. So this is the shortest. And if I go to a longer one, a much longer attack. So that just depends on the line and how I want to accentuate it. Now the other thing that I wanted to be sure to get was just flat out sustains. So they play really loud, or quieter, but the idea is they play really loud for a short amount of time. As opposed to the dying away from the portados. And a lot of times when I'm doing a line, I'll default to the portados, but I'll throw a sustain in there every now and then, depending on what I want to do. And then I can loop the, uh, the top sustain is a... Is just looped. But another great thing about having three different performances from three different pairs of horns is they have three different loop points on every note. They're completely different. So I could hold down a note and you really don't hear any looping of the material. 
at all. And something else that I worked really hard on, and maybe there's some folks out there working on sample libraries that can take a little bit of this and, and use it in future libraries, but I have a real problem, whether it's Berlin or Spitfire, sample modeling is the only one that seems completely linear. But moving those controllers to get your dynamics, there always is some sort of a curve I have to work out. I have to make it look like this, or I have to make it like that, or sometimes I even have to do something like this. If you've ever massaged brass swells and crescendos, you know what I'm talking about. I wanted it just to be super linear and super clean, so that's why if I'm moving the, my MIDI data fader, I just up and down super smooth and it's a nice smooth transition between the layers. I have shorts and longs, and for horns I've got different kinds of rips, like four different kinds of rips, I think, depending on where the mod wheel is. Lots of effects. Let's talk about some effects here. The idea behind these, again, is like the way I do my string effects and things, where it's more of a performance. I'm gonna make sure I get my... And it'll just keep going. And you will be able to tell a loop only because you start to hear little things that stick out here and there when you're listening to just one player. But if you listen to all three of them, it's a lot busier and you're never gonna be able to hear that loop. And another thing that I tried to do, listen to the beginning of the sample. So it's different every time it starts. And it's a random start time, and that's random between all three horns. So again, you're getting, each one is randomly starting at three different positions, so you can do things that really do sound Sounds like players performing, because it's got that random randomness built into it. That's because it's aleatoric, which We'll talk about Dead Space and aleatoric stuff sometime, I promise. But I've got flutters, uh, bends. This is particularly nice because you can it really kind of showcases the... So we multiply that times three. I could just hold it down forever, and I also... went super low. And for the horns, <laughs> I forgot to mention, I did all of these articulations stopped as well, and all I do is move a MIDI fader and I can blend between the two, which is a huge time saver for me. Now the trombones, uh, bass bones, low brass, Again, same idea. I have three tenor bones, a bass trombone, a contrabass trombone, and a tuba. And they have all the same sort of articulations. So if I think I get this correct. That, of course, is a big fat unison. A lot of times when I'm writing anything that's not super epic trailer action sort of stuff. These are actually being split up into three, four, or five different parts. And it really does make a difference, just like with the horns, hearing those individual instruments playing the way I would have them orchestrated for live. Ah, uh, sample modeling. It's just such a great, now let me see. I'm going to pull the volume down a little bit because I don't want to get too loud.
So that's literally me playing live using two different controllers. One of them is controlling the volume, the other is controlling the vibrato. And what's really nice about the vibrato, you can get very silly with it, but it gets a little scary. And you can do it at different dynamic levels as well. There's so many things you can do it muted. You can have flutter tongue in there, sample modeling. Let's see. If I pull up sample modeling, get rid of all these EQs that I was checking out. So their interface looks like this, and they've got all kinds of. Well, that's kind of boring. Velocity curves, there we go, real-time sound shaping. There's all sort of stuff that you can adjust in real time with controllers, which makes a big difference for the performance. Uh, trumpets are the same way. And I've got the, I think there's trombones and low brass, but a lot of times, well, there's just not a lot of use for a solo trombone sort of thing. It ends up being um, a higher brass instrument, like horns, or trumpets, which is why I have those in here and I don't have the lower brass in the template. Just such a great tone. And like Berlin uh, Woodwinds and Berlin Brass, these are four separate horn players, and these are three separate trumpet players. And if you have the trombones, it's the same way. They even have like cornets and, and other flugelhorns and some crazy things like that. Just check out their website. This is all Peter Seidlicek sample modeling. Cinebrass, I'll give you an example of the extreme dynamics I was telling you about. So I just moved the mod wheel the tiniest bit. There's really no in-between soft and loud, and I think the reason that is is, to my ears, they sampled two dynamics. They've got really quiet and they've got really loud and they're doing a crossfade between the two. And I would love to tweak, I, I could, I guess, go into contact and tweak it, but if it's scripted, then that's not me, I'm not a scripting person. But I'd love that, that transition to happen a little higher on the CC controller. So Mike and Mike, if you end up watching this, you can put in a, a favor for me. Same thing with the trumpets, same thing with the trombones probably individual instruments down here. And I do love the tone of the hall at Sony. The engineer was genius, really amazing players. Uh, same sort of idea with Berlin and Spitfire. The controller cross sections can be a little funky sometimes. So Adventure Brass, this is actually part of musical sampling, which I've mentioned Aaron before, Aaron Sapp, his, I hope that's the way you pronounce your last name, dude. His stuff is really, really nice. And he's got a couple of different ideas that he uses, either adventure horns, trailer horns, I think that's it for brass. And then with strings, he's got adventure strings, trailer strings, and soaring strings, which we'll go over a little more when I'm looking at the string libraries. So Adventure is really nice. It's legato, but it's got that attack at the beginning of it. I don't even think I had it opened all the way.
Now if we contrast that with Majestic, Obviously a lot more attack, but what's nice is you can do the There, are you happy? But it's got round robins on it, which makes a really, really nice addition to writing those punchy sort of action-adventure kind of lines. Trailer horns is a different set of horns. I think adventure horns is four, maybe trailer horns is six or eight. I don't remember exactly. It's a little bigger. <laughs> and the Majestic probably does the same thing with the attacks. Now these have a pretty bright sound, and I don't mind that because honestly, I'm not using them on their own. I'm probably layering them with some of these other libraries up here to help the brass punch through the mix a little bit. One of the things they do have that's very nice Really well done crossfading. And I think there's a soft, maybe it's the strings I'm thinking of, they have a soft patch. And I love that when you've got three or sometimes four different layers of dynamics and you want to play something really soft, you're not given a lot of control because you want to mess with this lowest dynamic register. And when you just have the soft patch, basically they open it up to the whole continuous controller throw of the fader. And you can do a lot more with expression and not have to worry about adding additional volume curves and things. I'm a big fan of soft patches in general. And the trombones are the same way with adventures. So that's my brass template that I have in Cubase. As with the woodwinds on Patreon, I will have the link of this Cubase file minus the icons. We're going to look at mixing board things once I get to the end with strings, and you can see all the icons that I use. But those are from Marcus at Pound Sound. Amazing guy, fantastic icons. Also has his own YouTube channel, so be sure to check that out. I'll put the link in the description. And next, we will be doing, working down the line, keyboards, percussion, orchestral, and then strings. Until next time. <laughs>